when the scientific Magnificent Seven muster the careless and fraudulent coral reef scientists quiver. The Magnificent Seven, a group of seven international scientists, marine biologists, coral reef scientists, who ended up checking previous work that came out of the uh, James Cook University Coral Reef Centre. And this work supposedly showed that under elevated carbon dioxide level concentrations, a lot of reef fish went, well, frankly, crazy. They'd do things like swimming towards predators when they smelt them or becoming hyperactive or not knowing whether to swim left or right in when they're in a big school of fish, which is very important for some of these little fish. Now you can imagine that this work was huge when it first came out in the media. So for example, the New Scientist magazine uh, reported carbon dioxide levels in ocean acts like alcohol on fish, leaving them less able to judge risk and prone to losing their senses. So if you burn coal, the fish will go crazy. Now, the Magnificent Seven showed, well, in the words of the prophet, this was all complete baloney, right? It was wrong. It was false. They found that eight major reports by prestigious scientists from a very prestigious uh, organization was hopelessly 100% wrong, and that additional work was actually genuinely fraudulent. You can just imagine that this did not make the Magnificent Seven very popular with a lot of other Great Barrier Reef scientists. In this episode, we're going to look at some of the details of this faulty science. In the next episode, we're going to look at the way the science institutions responded and how this huge quality assurance failure is actually inevitable and that it will keep happening because nothing was actually learnt on it. Now, we're going to start with Una Lonstedt, who was a PhD student at James Cook University Coral Reef Centre, working under the supervision, or should I say, not enough supervision, of some senior uh, scientists there. In the short time that uh, Lonstedt had been at JCU, she'd published an astonishing number of high-profile papers on fish behaviour. This is where you put fish in a, a tank and you observe their behaviour. One claimed that damselfish living in degraded systems, which may be degraded by climate change, lose their sense of smell and become fearless and very likely to be eaten by predators. The topic of another paper was on the effect of increasing carbon dioxide levels on the ability of damselfish to respond to predators. And she observed how fish behaved in laboratories and she found they were more likely to be eaten by predators with higher carbon dioxide levels. It was classic doom science, end of the world stuff, and she got fame and she got attention and she had a rosy future after publishing such groundbreaking work. When Lonstedt finished her PhD at JCU, she moved back to Sweden and to Uppsala University, where she did some more of this groundbreaking work on different but equally trendy topic, that's microplastics. And she found that small fish preferred eating microplastic than their normal food, which made them grow more slowly and, you guessed it, it made them more susceptible to being eaten by predators. And this is where the Magnificent Seven came in because uh, they proved that Lonstedt had actually fabricated most of that data which was done in the, in the laboratory. This was ultimately proven beyond doubt by investigations by the Uppsala University itself. But even before that microplastic work, the Magnificent Seven had been alerted to some of this other work, not just by Una Lonstedt, but by her supervisors and by her co-workers. And they'd try to check the work on the effect of carbon dioxide on fish sense of smell and getting themselves eaten and the like. This was a huge amount of work that was done by the, the Seven. It was meticulously recorded. And in the end, they, as I said, they've checked these eight very important reports produced over many, many years, co-authored by about a dozen different senior scientists 
at a particular very prestigious university and found them to be totally wrong, 100% rubbish. There was no effect of carbon dioxide on the fish. Carbon dioxide had no impact on whether little fish would swim towards predators when they smelt them. Carbon dioxide had no impact on the activity of the fish. They were not becoming hyperactive. And carbon dioxide had no impact on this fish turn behaviour. There was be no impact on the schooling behaviour of the fish. Now look, this doesn't mean that carbon dioxide doesn't have an effect on climate, but it says for sure that you've got to start asking serious questions about how such high profile work from very prestigious uh, institution by prestigious um, scientists could be published, peer reviewed and spread around the world like it's gospel and so much of it to be fundamentally and totally wrong. Now, this was animal behavior, which was done largely in aquaria. And one of the remarkable things about this original work was that none of the original work was video. So it was impossible to check any of it. This is unlike what the Magnificent Seven did, where they were meticulous in their recording. So this was a huge red, red flag right from the beginning. And as Timothy Clark, uh, one of the Magnificent Seven, said, so the elephant remains patiently sitting in the room. How is it possible that our results are so dramatically different from a decade of publications by another research group? We cannot provide a satisfactory answer to that question at the moment. And you might like to subscribe and uh, like this video and even make some comments. But if you do make comments, just be careful about using that F word, uh, fraud, because it can get us into a spot of bother. But it was a very good question, wasn't it, raised by Timothy Clark. You know, it takes a great skill to be consistently wrong so often. Now, even if you screw up 50% of the time, to get eight out of eight wrong, that's only a one in 256 chance that you can do that. Now, this means that there is either spectacular incompetence or something else. Now, the number of scientists involved was, well, a dozen or so. But let's take a, an even closer look at Una Lonstedt, who was trained at that institution and was proven to be fraudulent in Sweden after leaving JCU. What about her work at JCU? Well, let's have a look at one of her papers, and this involved lionfish, which live on the Great Barrier Reef. And while the other fish that Lonstedt seemed to study were all awfully stupid, actually, they'd eat plastic and become fearless and get eaten, or they were uh, do some other silly thing, the lionfish were apparently incredibly clever. So Lonstedt studied the behavior of these fish and found that they could communicate with each other by waving their fins at each other. So when they were hunting in packs, one fish would sort of like wave to the other fish and cut the prey off at the pass or whatever. It was quite remarkable stuff. And this, of course, hit the big time in the media. Of course, there was no video taken of any of the records. But suspicions started to be raised to the journal that Lonstep published the work in, in because to do these experiments, you'd need a lot of lionfish. And lionfish are very rare and very hard to catch. Her written records suggested she only had a dozen fish. But Lonstedt ended up supplying this picture of 50 fish, which she implied she'd used in her work. And there are indeed 50 photographs uh, but the question is, how many different fish are in these photographs? So I took some time to analyze these photographs, and you could actually look at the digital camera number of each of those photographs on this collage, and you find some interesting things. Firstly, there are some duplicates. Then some are the same picture, but mirror imaged. Others are the same picture, but the color's been changed on Photoshop or whatever. And then there's a lot of them where clearly it's the same fish, but actually it's the, the next consecutive photograph on the camera. So how hard would it be to get a different fish, get it in almost exactly the same position as the previous fish, 
and then take a shot with it with the camera on the next consecutive photograph. It's effectively impossible. So there was something very fishy about that work from the start. But in fact, my uh, part in this is all very minor. It was the Magnificent Seven who exposed the majority of the faulty work here. But the Magnificent Seven's work doesn't stop here. It also included looking at a fellow PhD student uh, of Lonsdale called Danielle Dixon. And it turned out that some of the work that Dixon performed when she returned home to her home in the United States, also on the impact of carbon dioxide on fish, was also found to be fabricated. So the University of Delaware, where she worked, did an a, a investigation and made the statement, the university has confirmed to the journal that it has accepted an investigative panel's conclusion that marine ecologist Daniel Dixon committed fabrication, falsification in work on fish behaviour and coral reefs. Fabrication, falsification, big words for she made stuff up. So two students from the same lab left JCU and were then proven by their new universities to have been, well, fraudulent. Did they learn that at JCU? Did they see it at JCU or, and emulate it? Or did they both just become wayward and fraudulent by coincidence after they left? So you can see that the Magnificent Seven, they uncovered a complete rat's nest of what can only be described as at best utter scientific incompetence, 100% failure to be able to re repeat any of their results, or at worst a fair bit of fraud which certainly followed. Now, this is not the worst part of this story. Far worse is the way that most of the institutions ended up reacting to this failure. Cover-up, obfuscation, denial, shooting the messenger, Magnificent Seven. And it demonstrates the huge quality assurance failings that we have right through science and that nothing's ended up being learnt from that. We will look at this disgusting response from the institutions in the next episode. Well, thanks for watching. If you want more information, they're in the Plato GBR website below. And also, if you have suggestions for topics you want us to cover in the future, put those in the comments. We read all the comments. Thanks very much. <laughs>